Uh, three quick little things. Uh, I've got a mental block, and you, you're a gentleman, and you didn't nail me on it, but uh, I called you, I, I, I cannot call Gunter Gunter. I call him Joachim, and I, I, keep, I don't know why that is. It happens three out of four times. Well, it's uh, because Gunter is, is a first name, but it's also a surname. And uh, Joachim is sort of a variation of Joachim, which is also a first name. So, there, you, you're totally excused. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I do know a guy named Joachim, and so I was going, well, that's it. It's a guy, it's one of these guys with two first names. It drives me crazy. But then I, I thought, hold it. His name is Arthur Joachim. So that doesn't work, because that's his, you know, his last name too. Anyways, apologize for that. An, another name thing, there was a, another company called Syngenta who does invest in wheat as well. They weren't on that earlier slide along with, with Bayer and Kenter and, and, and Lima Green. Um, and one more little thing that just popped in my head. You were saying that uh, the, the, the breeding is funded by the commissions, WGRF. I was waiting for you to say taxpayers to a large degree as well, which is, I think, part of, part of the challenge. So, anyways, let's get some questions out from the floor. There's a speaker over there. Please use the speaker, so, uh, the mic, so we can hear you. Hello. Is it, work? is it working? There we go. Yes. Stephen Vanderbilt, Farmer, Southern Alberta. Um, yeah, where do we start with all this? Um, <laughs> To me, I think we've done a horrible job explaining it to the farmer. To me, this is, I, I see this so much emotion, and it just seems like such a no, I, I must be missing something, because it seems like such a no-brainer, right? Like, where's the risk to the farmer? And I think, there is a couple, though. I'm not saying there's no risk, but I said, well, why, like, why are you so upset? Like, you can just status quo is there. A new variety comes out. If you want to pay for it, it's a return on investment, you do it. Just like we've talked about canola varieties, you know, the, Newest, best ones sell first, and no one really cares about the price because there's a return there. But there is a few things we need to, to do to change this and to get farmers to, uh, to maybe dial back a bit. But one of the big concerns I have, and some of the farmers have, and I think it's a legitimate concern, maybe, maybe this concern, maybe the only risk to all this is deregistration of old varieties. So everybody's scared that all these new varieties are going to come out. Status quo won't be there in five years because all these varieties will be deregistered de and you can only get varieties that you have to pay royalties on. So I think if there's a way to alleviate that where you can't deregister varieties for no reason and they're, they're always there to grow. And so if we can get that, to me that's the only risk to this is, the, is because commissions going to be there funding, uh, the, the public guy's going to be there, the private guy's going to be there, everybody's going to be there with the status quo, but, and you can just choose any of the new stuff. But as long as the original stuff is there for people and they can make that choice, but hey, I'll pay five bucks an acre for this new variety for endpoint royalty, whatever it is, but I'll, or I can just pay nothing and clean my own seed of this variety because it's there. But, but if we start going down the road, and that's what I've heard, feel that, and I'm not sure if Australia is like that, but some of those people are saying that you just re register all the old stuff and... Uh, and then you only have the, the, the high paying varieties to, uh, as a choice. So I think that's just an option of getting out there, getting pe the farmers uh, more educated. Because as far as I'm concerned, it, it, it really is a no brainer. So Anthony, you want to take a yeah, crack at uh, Absolutely. Uh, is that on? Can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for that question. And that's actually come up um, and very early in the consultation process. Uh, it was raised by producers, so we went back and, and did some homework and said, okay, in wheat, is this currently a problem? Um, and, and we don't believe it is. And that's largely because the public sector is the dominant player and they don't deregister the varieties. And, and so you know, um, the way the Seeds Act and regulations are set up right now, all the registrant needs to do is say, I don't want to carry the, market, uh, the variety in the marketplace any longer and then there's a three-year process to go through to deregister. So it has to be available for a period of time, and then it get, gets deregistered. When we crunch the numbers, I think 461 wheat varieties, only 13 ever held plant breeders' rights, and then were deregistered. So it's, it's a very low number. But we share the same concerns that over time, if there's more private sector investment, here's a potential way to um, 
remove varieties from the marketplace. And I have to say, fundamentally, as someone who um, administers intellectual property law, I've got a problem with that because the idea is it's a social contract, right? The innovator, you benefit for a little while, and then the variety becomes public domain after you've benefited, and then everyone can use it unrestricted, right? So it creates a challenge. There is also an argument to be made that you still need some sort of deregistration process in case the variety is causing market harm. Like if something crops up and say, okay, it's got disease susceptibility or it's got some sort of characteristic that's gonna damage our export market or producers, so you gotta get it out of the market quite quickly. So I guess what we're proposing is to say, the Seeds Act and regulations are up for renewal um, in the next few years and I think finding a me mechanism to get that balance is probably the best way to do it. So you don't want to say no deregistration because there's scenarios where having one of those varieties, it might come to light that it causes market harm and you might, but also deregistration solely for the purposes of wanting to flush it from the marketplace is probably not a good idea either. So. We're thinking about that, and we have it on the radar, and, and we're going to look for some way to have a balanced approach to take care of it. So presumably there would be, uh, if there's harm to the environment, then there could be harm to the, the company that owns the seed. Yeah. That, so there'd be a liability, there's a liability that you'd have to deal too. with at yeah. the same time. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. It's uh, Mary Jane Bennett. I'm asking questions on behalf of myself and Bill Cooper of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, the question is directed to Jason, and are the funds from the Commodity Commission's WGRF governments and private industry inadequate uh, uh, using various efficiency measures available? And I've got a secondary question. Have there been any estimates of the total bucket of funds required to service the requirements of the three prairie provinces? So I guess I'll take the first one regarding the commission investment into varieties. Right now, the, the commissions know, even combined, they, there's no way that we can fund the total amount that it takes to uh, develop a variety. I think on the one slide I showed, um, Commission dollars uh, going into variety de development are approximately just under $10 million per year, and that's coming from all the commissions, um, or 47 to 50 over five years. So uh, from what we know, there's obviously the public dollars that are going into it as well, the money from WGRF on top of that, that's, um, you know, we know as commissions that we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, I'll take the second one. <laughs> Jason, Jason team here. Um, the total bucket of money, uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I guess from our company's perspective, um, you know, we don't have a figure in mind. Uh, I, I guess when we look more broadly um, uh, across other industries that uh, seem to have um, significant investment incentives, um, we, we tend to find that uh, the value um, returned to the plant breeder is around about 1% farm gate value. Um, and, you know, in reality, I think that's a fair, fair um, number or percentage to be at, um, how you actually come to uh, administrate that or, or collect that uh, we're talking about today. But I think generally around that 1% farm gate is, is where, you know, a lot of globally where everyone else is investing right now. Thanks uh, for that. There's just two um, um, smaller housekeeping questions. If the royalties were collected on all farm marketings, would the current funding entities discontinue or be reduced? And also, uh, would farmers have a choice in what commodities they excluded or included? So I, I, can, I can take one part of that question. Um, certainly, um, from government perspective, at least for, in terms of AAFC funding, we've been very clear. Um, there's no intention to reduce funding from AAFC for, for variety development. There is a desire over time to find ways that government could complement uh, the activities that might happen in the private sector or by producer groups if they wish to, to fund. And the idea is we would be securing additive investment. So, 
Um, from an AFC perspective, uh, no intention to reduce funding. Uh, we want that additional funding to be complementary. I can't speak on terms of the, the universities because um, uh, entities like Crop Development Centre are, are large players in Sirius as well. Uh, I will say that um, they certainly look at, at uh, royalty revenue as a good way to bolster their activities. And uh, the, the last question, uh, would farmers have uh, a choice in what commodities they excluded or included? So yeah, it, it's, uh, that's a good question. So um, right now the focus, at least for this value creation model, has been wheat. That was the spark for the discussion and then it quickly evolves to say, well, if it's applicable to wheat, could it be applicable to um, other cereals like oats and barley, if that would work? Uh, and then further than that, I think the discussion started to, to broaden to say, okay, pulses might actually work under this model, um, and so would flax. Government hasn't made any decisions on, on that. Um, we're focused on cereals because that's where the ask was of government to focus at this point in time. But I think if other commodity groups were to, to come up and say, we think this could work for flax, uh, you know, we'd like to, to, to try it, um, you know, we'd be open to that. Okay, think, thank you. I'll, I'll maybe just add to that. I, I think there, you know, there are models out there, um, you know, where it shows where the need to have public investment um, needs to continue. And, and the one that I can think of um, right off the top is we just happen to have some members who are part of the 3P uh, program um, uh, with uh, Cantera, Alberta Wheat Commission, and, and AFSC and Lacombe in doing a CPS wheat breeding program there. I think that's a prime example of, you know, maybe something that should be explored more and, and uh, maybe a direction that the industry should look at. Yeah. And Bill had a, oh, sorry. Sorry, if maybe I just take a few minutes to, to add to that. I think Jason raises a really excellent point is um, over time, you might find that certain classes or crop types become um, fairly sustainable in, in their funding. And I think that's a good, good thing. But um, there's always going to be a need for government to be the spark um, the seed money really in the development of new crop kinds or new classes or new end, end use purposes. And I think that's one of the attractive things that government sees out of this is um, to be in a, a place where it can fill the gap that others can't, so. Um, Bill's final, uh, this comes from Bill. Uh, 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 we know that ag researchers in particular, uh, plant breeders are not keen on setting up their offices in Western Canada and choose to serve Canada from the USA. Um, can, you, can you comment on that further? Uh, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Saskatoon. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if, 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 if there is incentive to be here, then, then anyone, whether large or small, will set up here. Um, it's, I don't think, um, I don't think there'll be any issues there, to be perfectly honest. Well, it was a concern of Bill's, and he says he's uh, definitely a supporter of agricultural research, including plant breeding, but just wanted to ensure that offices are maintained in Canada and aren't serviced from uh, foreign uh, jurisdictions. Thank okay. you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Um, thank you to Bill, even though he's not here. I think if anybody missed it last night, this is only a second uh, me, uh, convention I think he's ever missed. So he hasn't technically missed this one now, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, Matt Sawyer, again here. Um, I wonder about, uh, going back to what Stephen said about, about the rolling out of the program, uh, basically looking at possibly the, the public backlash of, of, um, of uh, even from the public of, of the impression that we're only going to be controlled by the Big Ten, you know, about the, the Big Ten, uh, big bad corporate ag, and I think we have to get past that. And uh, basically, the next rollout, we should be looking at rolling out, a, uh, putting a roadmap out of who owns what, who's invested in what, to what point. And then, and then, and then once and describe and explain what more funds need to be administered at what point. 
And then questions like that can be answered is, uh, will public varieties still be released? Or will, it, will there only be privates that we have to pay an endpoint on? Um, and basically, the last question I had is, at $3 a ton, you're basically looking at it on an 80 bushel wheat crop. That's eight bucks an acre. Um, what will the perception of a producer say, hey, so you're telling me that once I buy my certified seed, and there is obviously the brown bagging of seed, which is not good, but uh, to fork out another eight bucks an acre for seed, unless it really is something truly amazingly special, that, that is quite a significant cost. But I thought uh, maybe we can comment a bit about the rollout of who owns what at what point, and if we're going to have to pay more for the commissions too, as far as a checkoff, it, that we have to make darn sure to our, if we want this to be brought forward and accepted, by the public, we need new varieties. That, that admin cost has to be absolutely transparent and low. Like, we have to keep it low, you know. But maybe your comments on some of those guys. I'll maybe go first, Matt. Uh, I think as far as continued commission funding and who's paying what into these varieties, I think, you know, it'd be, I don't know if it could really realistically happen where there's a uh, endpoint royalty or a tra trailing seed royalty tied to a public variety that commissions are already paid into because obviously those dollars are coming from their levy collection to begin with. So, you know, that, as I mentioned earlier, those dollars could go into some sort of 3P partnership um, similar to the ones that are already in place. And I think your comments about, you know, whether it's $8 a ton or $8 an acre, I think that that's where my suggestion of having a cap on any sort of royalty system may come into play and, and you know it's probably not a real popular idea but I think as, as farmers we have to have some control over what that actual uh, input cost is going to be so um, you know maybe it starts at three dollars an acre for the, the best variety that's in the marketplace but maybe we should also consider reviewing that cap after a five-year period or a ten-year period because if the breeding companies can continue to boost the yields and, and you know, maybe fusarium resistance comes along at some point, then it increases our return on investment that much more. We can pay more on the royalty um, at the bottom of it. So, uh, can, can I add uh, something on that? Uh, we can't forget, and I think you touched on it, uh, Jason, that commission checkoff dollars aren't uh, aren't government money. It's our money. So I'm going to throw something really wild and crazy out, out there. Why don't we uh, reduce the commission checkoffs by the exact amount that go into funding right now? And can a royalty not go to a public uh, variety through a trailing uh, one or an endpoint royalty one? I don't know, it's, it's just a question. Why don't we start with a clean slate, like with a blank sheet of paper, rather than having uh, commission checkoffs that, you know, they take a little bit of money, put it towards uh, breeding, uh, put some towards uh, other research that they do. Uh, is that the right way of doing it? Uh, and then adding an endpoint royalty on top of that, yeah, all of a sudden it gets very expensive. So nobody wants that. So why can't we have uh, a system that is purely towards breeding? I don't know, it's just. Yeah, and, and I agree. And you need to understand that um, money going towards breeding right now um, from checkoffs and other sources isn't just commercial delivery of varieties. Like, it's, there's a lot of research and that goes on that's really, really important for improving and delivering new varieties. Like, well, there, you, you've got to understand there's two sort of sections here of research. One is what we do, and we package together the technology and deliver it to you in seed. And, and then the other component, which happens in the public sector as well as that component, is discovering the new traits um, uh, understanding the genetics behind them um, and, and feeding them into the breeding program so they can package all the good traits to, together and, and deliver them. And I think that is always going to be a need, well there is, always going to be a need 
for that sort of research and money needs to be there through a check off or whoever else to be able to, to, to fund that pre-competitive um, uh, research. And I just want to touch on another point about caps on, on, um, on uh, royalties. Um, I'll just caution you around that one because um, you know, who's to say that um, next year that, that a company or an organisation could discover something with phenomenal um, value that can frame shift the amount of value that a farmer can generate from a, a new variety. And, and putting a cap on it, uh, on, on royalty, would mean that there wouldn't be much incentive for, for someone to bring that to market. So if you're you know, delivering an extra $100 an acre, which would be pretty special, um, why, why is it um, unreasonable to ask for you know, a proportion of that above what a cap might deliver on, on a traditional variety? So I'll just caution you on that one. Maybe I'll just take two seconds to add a few comments. Um, uh, Matt, I think you're, you're right. Um, traceability of the money is critically important. Uh, understanding all the various flows of money into uh, breeding and variety development. But I think there's also an important distinguishment that we have to make between, and Jason articulated perfectly. We're using R&D and breeding as synonymous terms, and they're not. Um, Research and development, a lot of things are in the public benefit and the public good and need to be funded, and they don't have any mechanism of self-sustaining. So I think what happens is we get a lot of buy-in saying, well, we're funding R&D, but in truth, how much of that money is really going to applied breeding, which is making crosses, handling the lines, putting in the field, making selections, and, and we have to understand that those are not quite the same thing. So that, that's critically important. Uh, the one thing, and I think my slide where I tried to articulate it, uh, and it's something government's very conscious of, is striking the right balance. When you strike, and that came out in that slide, that if you can maximize the benefits to producers as well as to breeders and minimize the um, overhead costs in terms of administration, that's your win-win scenario where everyone benefits the most. So it's almost trying to work backwards and say, how do you achieve that outcome where uh, everyone gets the maximum benefit? Um, and just to your point, you know, it was mentioned for, from Gunter about uh, it, investing and having royalties go to public varieties. And indeed, if any of these models were to come out, the first beneficiaries would be public institutions. And I can tell you, at least in the case of CDC, that's critically important for sustainable funding, to have that continuous flow of, of royalty revenue. Plant breeding is a very long-term activity. Um, you, you don't talk in two-year, five-year cycles, like funding cycles sometimes happen. It's a minimum a 20-year venture, so you have to have a degree of confidence that you're gonna have sustainable funding for that period of time. Thank you, guys. And my final comment on is, it is back to the rollout, and after talking with David, uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hansen, he was explaining, you know, you, you want to put in some money, and I'm not speaking for you, David, but, you know, if you put in a significant investment, of course, you want to re get some return on it, then, then there's nothing wrong with making money. Um, but, uh, you know, farmers have seen, and some of them probably aren't aware of the rollout on, say, for example, the Canadian Grain Commission when we had the open market, and R uh, Mr. Ritz told us you have to keep the Grain Commission for quality assurance, and boom, a buck 81 was thrown at us, and then it was dropped, and now they have a massive surplus of 100 and whatever, 40 million, and it just shows how easy the wrong number can be brought forward, and a massive surplus for, you know, uh, basically a tax on farmers. And um, we're not, the, the, it's two different things, but I'm saying on the rollout, if we want, if we want this to stick, we're gonna have to, have to get the right number and, uh, and be transparent, I think. Plus, we should be using that money from the Canadian Grain Commission for our new varietal development, maybe. <laughs> but thanks, guys. <laughs> I don't see Patty here. Is Patty in the room? No. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jared Gust, farmer from Davidson, Saskatchewan. I've worn different hats. I've been chair of the wheat growers. I've been around Sask Wheat, Sask Pulse, WGRF, all kinds of commissions, and talking about this for years, and, and really trying to understand it. The whole varietal registration system and, and how to properly incorporate that 
with our bulk handling system, our whole Canadian Grain Commission, it's all an integrated system that we have to be careful which blocks we pull out and push in because we're all trying to make a better system. But how do we, because we have to generally dump grain in a pit in Davidson and Rosetown and St. Francis Xavier, and it's generally the same stuff, how do we avoid a bunch of Me Too varieties and just more of the same at higher cost? Because I really believe that we have to do better at value creation, value attraction. But the difference in most varieties, because they have to be classified in the same system to go in this, to perform the same in a mill in Indonesia and Dubai and Canada is, is all the same. So how, how do we create things? And then also with the registration system, it seems very incestuous where, okay, I'll support your variety, you support mine, and we're going to keep Gunter's out because we don't like Gunter. His is pretty good, but we just don't like him. So I, I, I don't know if I've created more questions than answers, but things that we have to uh, think about. I, I guess I can take that one because I um, have worked through that system before, unless anyone else wants to take it. Um, yes. So uh, you, you're exactly right. Like it, this is just not one thing. Like the whole the whole system um, um, from uh, from breeding, funding breeding, right through to you know variety delivery and um, how how we maintain um, you know classes and and how to understand you know, what traits are important to our customers and all of those sorts of things. They're all integrated, right? Um, so um, your points are, are taken well, and I think there is an appetite um, within the industry and to, to, to look at all of these different um, aspects of variety delivery. Um, we're talking about one aspect right now, which is the funding component. Um, but I, I think uh, the registration system that you just spoke about it, the evolution in that system over the last five years has been phenomenal. Okay, the more work that needs to be done to be able to um, allow um, uh, exceptions and, and allow um, entry to market um, uh, as less impeded as possible. And, and I think um, the people who are, are on these committees recognise that. Um, is it perfect now? No. Um, but I think... Um, uh, over time, um, the, it will evolve, um, and uh, we'll um, allow, you know, the, the, the not the me toos, but the the new and improved things come through and delivered faster and better to to grow as when it's needed. So, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Jared, I'll just add to that real quick. Um, I I think right now we're at the cookie cutter uh, stage. And opening that up, I think, only uh, increases the chances of, of real diversity. You know, I farm in a Red River Valley, and uh, all the great varieties in Saskatchewan that work good for you really don't work for me. They either, what's that? I know, but there's, uh, um, you know, there's some good varieties in Saskatchewan that, that will grow about this tall in a Red River Valley or they'll, uh, they'll be full of fusarium. Uh, mind you, now you have fusarium problem as well. And, and so I hope opening this up, creating value, uh, bringing the private sector in, I'll be able to open my, my seed guide and go, okay, well, I've got a whole bunch, right? Like in canola, we grow, uh, on our farm, we grow uh, pod shatter resistant. They're not necessarily the highest uh, yielding, but they really fit my agronomic, uh, on my farm, my, my agronomic practices. We don't have a swather, so we straight cut everything. I only grow pod shatter varieties. We, we'd love to grow Nexera because you can eke out a little bit better margin, but uh, they don't have the right varieties. So I'm hoping on the wheat side, it will go the same way. The other thing that I'd like to just uh, bring up be because uh, Matt was really concerned about uh, a runaway on seed costs and royalty and so on. 
Jason, why don't you tell them how it's working out in, in Australia? Like have seed costs exploded and, and run away? Uh, no, they, they haven't. Um, I guess what they, they saw in Australia, uh, which is an endpoint royalty, right? Um, and um, the first varieties were um, having a 50 cent uh, a tonne uh, delivered um, royalty rate on them. And, and as companies established and um, uh, were burning cash, <laughs> uh, that, that rate um, increased quite rapidly. Um, in a short period of time, but then it plateaued very quickly because um, as uh, companies started making money and, and f found that um, you know, keeping royalty rates down was a competitive advantage, uh, it, it, it plateaued very quickly at around about the $3 a tonne, which is about 1% farm gate. Um, so that's what happened there. Um, and I think competition was the big thing that um, kept kept the seed rates down um, to that level. Oh, we're... I'll be, okay. Five seconds. Five seconds. Wow, that's <laughs> tough for me. Uh, so, <laughs> thanks, Jason. Uh, just to add a little bit to that, so point taken from Jared, I think, um, you know, uh, we always have to be looking at regulations and seeing do we have the right degree of regulatory oversight. And I think there's a good opportunity when the seeds act in regulations, sorry, seed regulations come up for review in the next couple of years to kind of address that. But I think, you know, we also have to think in government, the evolutionary approach seems to work best is we can't seem to fix all things at the same time. That doesn't work. We have to bite off chunks and fix what we can. And I think what we're talking about here is trying to get the investment climate right. And then after that, figure out what is the appropriate regulatory environment to have afterwards. Just on Jason's point, um, we've done some analysis, looked at those countries, Australia, competitive, six, seven uh, breeding entities, uh, France, 12 breeding entities competing, um, UK, eight. So by its very nature, that seems to keep a check on, on things sort of escalating out of control price-wise. Alarm's gone off twice now totally scaring these people thinking it was their phone, it was my Apple Watch, so you're cool. Um, so if we can grab the question quick and we'll address them as we walk down, because some people have to run up and get the coats yet. And then if it's a, a really stellar question and really good information, we'll share it at the other end somehow with folks. No, I just wanted to say two things. Because I'm independent, I'm not a grain company and I'm not a grower, uh, but Two things. I think we should always have Cooper stand in, ask his questions. They seem to go, they seem to go a lot faster when Coop doesn't ask him. So, so I want that in the minutes somewhere. Uh, second thing, I, I really want to uh, echo Gunter's point. Of, it's got to be endpoint because other, any other system is going to be fraught with, with fraud and misuse. And this room's all going to pay the royalties, and no one, other people won't. And there's just way too much moral hazard in anything other than an endpoint collection because we can administer that as an industry relatively seamlessly. And with the, the Richardson family and Viterra and a few of the, we get a high percentage really quickly. And so uh, it makes for a fair playing field. So that's my only comment. Thanks, Dean. Alana? Yeah, just quickly. Alana Cook, farmer from uh, Saskatchewan. So I, I just think about how exciting it is for us to be having the conversation about value creation because I think about what we'd imagine post wheat board monopoly. This is exactly the conversation we wanted to have was to see investment and incentive to get us having wheat being more profitable and, you know, much more important part of our rotation rather than uh, sort of, oh, well, I guess we have to grow wheat, dang it, this year, even though it sucks and we can't make any money. So this is a great conversation, thinking about the exciting opportunities ahead for wheat. And, it, you know, so great to see Lima Grain and Cantera with their investment. And hopefully, if we get the value creation model right, we'll see other companies make those same kind of investments, having that confidence in uh, Western Canada and our farmers and in our, you know, sort of R&D um, and innovation thinking that we have. So uh, just thank you for your uh, conversation today and for having this session. And I would say I'm also really pleased to see us moving past the conversation of whether or not we're going to have a value creation model instead to 
which is the model and how are we gonna answer now, answer now those niggly detailed questions, which is gonna take us a while to figure out, but we need to move past the fact that we're just gonna keep things where we are because we, there's no way there's enough public investment in what we need to see to have, you know, sort of game-changing varieties, as Gunter was saying, to meet all of our agronomic needs. So I, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you, and I'm pleased to see us moving forward. And I will just leave you with one thought, because I do think it is a bit of a, I'm not gonna say a scare tactic, but maybe a bit of a red herring out there with regards to this conversation, which is a lot of people say, well, you know, we already have these commissions, and, uh, and we, we have WGRF, and so, um, you know, maybe those commissions need to go away because now we're gonna have this private model of um, seeing varietal development. And I would like to say that I have never heard anything more ridiculous in my life. Those commissions play an important role. Our checkoffs go into much more than just variety development. In fact, in the case of, say, canola, where we do see private seed, we know the value of those checkoff organizations and the value of what those commissions pay for. It's in, um, as you mentioned, Anthony, you know, public good type R&D that goes on, not just variety development. Uh, long-term investment in other research that goes on that might be about value-added, might be about other components that are important to the crop. Uh, the other thing is they do provide, um, you know, input on regulations, on uh, trade policy, on transportation policy, as well as public trust, which is becoming more and more of an issue. So I just want to make sure that nobody in commissions and uh, think that somehow we're threatening them, nor should farmers think that if we see this private model coming forward in wheat, which absolutely is vital in my view, that this means that we don't need our checkoff organizations anymore, because we do, we need that voice there for the farmer to remain and be strong. So I just wanted to you know, make sure that we take that issue off the table. Thank you very much. Thanks, Solana. thanks for all the questions. Had a long list of a dozen, didn't need any of them. And thanks to the panelists. Gunter, <laughs> Jason, Jason, and Anthony, we'll hand it back to Dave.